heart is the muscle that works the most in our whole body. It beats a hundred thousand times a day and pumps five litres of blood every minute. And it never ever rests. According to the Texas Heart Institute, if the heart was a fountain, its power would make blood reach 10 meters high. The human heart is able to beat during some time outside of our body since it generates its own electrical impulses. Did you know that listening to music while you're exercising helps oxygenate the heart? It turns out that music increases the diameter of blood vessels and makes the blood flow a lot better. Laughter <laughs> has incredible benefits on the heart since it is able to increase blood circulation. So everyone has to have fun <laughs> and make others laugh. The truth is that the heart is the engine in our body and we need to take care of it. We need to eat healthy and do lots and lots of physical exercise. You probably knew that already, didn't you? Anybody hear anything in that video you didn't already know about your heart? Maybe you didn't know that if your heart was removed from your chest, it would continue to beat, uh, never having tried that yourself, I'm guessing. I'm curious though, how many of you have ever visited a doctor whose specialty was the heart? We call them cardiologists. Anybody ever visited a cardiologist? Anybody in this room? I see quite a few hands going up. Anybody ever uh, observed that your heart was doing something that... Um, Maybe made you a little nervous. I don't know. Maybe, maybe your heart, yes, okay. There's a brother over here that recently had uh, several bypasses uh, installed in his heart, yes. And so, yeah. But your heart ever beat so hard you could feel it on the outside? How about your heart ever uh, been in your throat? You know, that's an expression that means, you know, I was kind of choked up, right? My heart's in my throat. Has your heart ever been broken? Now, you've noticed already I'm, I'm changing the subject, aren't I? Have you ever been to a cardiologist for a broken heart? Maybe not. Well, it depends on how we define broken. And as it happens, it depends on how we define heart as well. I wonder if you know as much about your heart from a medical perspective. How many chambers in the heart? Four. Well done. Uh, the two places that uh, your, the blood flow going out of your heart heads to, one, one goes to the lungs and the other goes to the rest of your body, right? The heart's very important, right? You stop the heart, you stop the life. You knew that. It's also possible to have a, a heart that uh, is diseased. We call it heart disease. It's possible that the, the blood flow to your heart could become restricted and you could have a heart attack. Yes, okay, you knew that, right? Yeah, you know a lot about your heart. I wonder if you know as much about your heart from a biblical perspective. This series we're going to start here today, brand new series, called Heart Flow. You say, what a lame title, heart flow. Sounds like some kind of hippy-dippy nonsense, I don't know. Well, and the title for the sermon series comes directly from the Bible, so. <laughs> heart flow. And I get the title from this series from Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. And we're going to be studying the heart from a biblical perspective for seven weeks. Seven weeks. Now, why would we take so much time to learn about the heart. Well, because the Bible has a lot to teach about your heart. And here's the risk we run as Christians. 
You may know more about your heart from that little video that we watched. You said, oh, I knew all that. And chances are your kids know that pretty well too. They've been watching little videos like that. Uh, But here's the concern I have. You may not know as much about your heart from a biblical perspective as you do from a medical perspective. Let's face it. Our culture, our world, tends to spend much more time making sure you have a healthy blood pump than that the heart God is concerned about be healthy. If somebody says, how's your heart? Where does your head go? Does it go to the blood pump? Or does it go to the house God wants to live in? Well, maybe if you just recently had heart surgery, you'd be forgiven for answering the question, how the blood pump is doing. But today, we're going to consider your heart condition. And what is the state of your heart? Because the Bible has much to say about it. So if you haven't already, please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. A one-verse message today. And uh, somebody said to me, does that mean that it'll be shorter? And I said, you know that's not how it works. (laughs) Oh, man. Yes. Well, so cardiac care. I think you've already figured out we're not going to talk about the blood pump that's squeezing in your chest. We're going to talk about a, as it happens, much more important organ. Cardiac care. Did you know that the word cardiac comes from the Greek word for heart? Cardia is the word for heart in Greek. And we get our word cardiac. So we even, our words to describe the heart come right out of the Greek. And we're reading Hebrew though today. And so I'm going to read it to you first in Hebrew. And then I'm going to read it to you in English. Mikol mishmar netzor levicha. Kimimenu tots of hayin. You want to try that? No, I'm serious. You want to try it? Try this. Me call me shmore. Try that. That wasn't bad. Nitzor li becha. That sounds pretty good. It's a little Hebrew with an Alabama accent coming out of here. Yeah, that's good. Ki me menu. Totsof hayin. That's right. Good. Me kol more more than anything you guard. Nutsor liveha. Watch over your heart. Ki mi menu for from it. Totsof flow out hayin living things. Or, we could tweak it a little bit, is the fountain of life. In that video we just watched, they said, if your heart is a fountain, the blood could reach 10 feet, 10 meters high. And I said, hey, as it happens, the heart is a fountain. And that's what the NIV says. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. We're going to look at your heart flow through this series. Because everything you do flows not out of the blood pump squeezing in your chest, even when you're asleep, but out of your heart as the Bible defines it. Well, we already had a little kind of a mini quiz about this heart And I think you knew all of that. I wonder if you know what the Bible says your heart's job is. As it happens, your heart has a big job. Once again, let's differentiate between the mm, 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 that beats in your chest. It's very important. Without this pumping, you're dead. Okay, but we're not talking about that heart. We're not talking about the heart that lives right here. We're talking about the organ of your spiritual life. The place inside you from which everything you do flows out. Let's do a quick survey. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. If you want to, you can make notes of all of these references as I flip through them pretty quickly. And because I'm not going to stop and spend time on them. Uh, 
I don't mind going a little bit long, but let's not go through lunch. <laughs> Mark 2, 8. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? What's the heart do? It just says it right there. Thinks. The heart thinks. See it? What they were thinking in their hearts. You say, no, that's my brain. Well, now you're thinking medically. Don't think medically. Think biblically. Your heart thinks. Got it? You with me? Yes, nod so I hear you. Good, all right, good. The Proverbs declare the discerning heart seeks knowledge. Well, you can go with seeks, but what is it that it's seeking? Seeking to know. So what does your heart do? Your heart knows. <laughs> we, got, we covered things. Your heart knows. What you know is in your heart. You said, no, no, that's in my brain. Well, now we're going with what the Bible says here, all right? How about this one? The fool says in his heart, or her heart, there can be girl fools. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, that's a statement of belief. I believe there is no God. That's what the fool says. So what does your heart do? Believes. So let's review. Everything you think and know and believe comes from your heart, according to the Bible. Now, if you're already feeling like a little bit of like, well, I'm not sure, so sure I agree. Let's just let the Bible be the Word of God, and let's allow God to define our heart's job, because that's what He's doing here, all right? And we've already heard everything we do flows out of the heart, so now we've already found out everything I think and know and believe comes up out of my heart. Okay, how about this one? When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. What does your heart do? It can fear, or it can rejoice, or it can mourn, or it can, and so what do we call that? Well, we call it emotions, right? Your heart emotes, it feels, all right? The psalmist prays, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. What does the heart do? Yeah, that's it. You can, you can speak where I can hear you. It's all right. It's in, we're in church, but you're allowed to say it out loud. Desires. So your heart desires. And then what does Jesus say to the Pharisees? He said, I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. What does your heart do? Loves. Or we could say it this way, values. We set our affection on certain things. And what he's saying is you claim to value God, to have your affection set on Him, to love Him. It's a lie. So we could also say the heart deceives, right? But we'll come to that later. So what we can say here is that everything you think and know and believe and everything you feel and desire and value, it all comes from your heart. And the Bible is just confirming itself. In Proverbs 4, 23, everything you do flows out of it. And we're already discovering that, yeah, this is just about everything. Colossians 3, 1, Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, to set one's heart on something in this case, on the things above, the things of God, is to do what? Well, it's the same as when you walked into Baskin Robbins. Maybe you stopped in for a cool treat, and the person behind the counter said, what? That's right. What flavor? <laughs> they didn't say, hey, would you like some ice cream? That's not helping them out. What flavor? And you said, well, I really had my heart set on chocolate or butter pecan or raspberry 
sherbet, I don't know, whatever it was, but you had your heart set on something, or maybe you didn't, and you walked in and you said, I'd like to try that, and try that, and try that, and then you tried them all and you said, that's the one I want, you set your heart on it, so to set one's heart is to what? What do they make you do at Baskin Robbins? You got to choose, <laughs> you got to choose. To choose to set one's heart above is to choose to honor, to follow, to love, to worship, to do all the things that God calls us to do. All right? So choose. And then Jesus, he just summarizes it. And, and I love that we go to Jesus and he just he says, yeah, okay, stop doing it piecemeal, Pastor Jonathan, and just tell him how it is. And Jesus says this, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are all bad choices, but specifically things that we think and feel, things that we intend, things that we say, things that we do, all come out of the heart. Jesus confirms Proverbs 4, 23 for us. And here you were thinking all your heart did was pump blood. Nope. Everything you think and know and believe, everything you feel and desire and value, everything you choose, you say, you do, comes from your heart. So, above all else, guard it. Because everything you do, your heart is the source of everything you are and everything you do. No, all, all we did here was we just let the Bible tell us what our hearts are and what they do. The Bible also tells us, Me kol mishmar, above everything you guard, netzor libeha, watch over your heart. Now, in English, we just have one word, guard. But in the Hebrew, there are two words. Mikol mishmar, shamar, is to watch over. Natsor, natsar in Hebrew is guard. Do you hear a little distinction between that? Watch over your heart, guard your heart. You say, well, they mean the same thing. Yeah, they do, but we're going to unpack the difference in the ambiguity between those two words here in just a little bit. But for now, I want, you to, I want you to keep it in your head that at some point, guard can mean one of two things. And we're going to unpack it here in just a second. Your heart is vulnerable. Your heart is vulnerable. And you knew this because we have a lot of doctors telling us to eat right and exercise. Eat right and exercise. What's the what's kind of a food you're not supposed to eat too much of for your heart health? French fries, fried food, any kind of fried food, don't eat too much of that, right? But what else? What's number two on the French fry that tastes really good that I want on top of all my food? Salt, <laughs> right? So it's a double whammy. High in fat, high in sodium, not good for the heart. Now, how did you know that? How did you know that? You're like, well, everybody knows that. Yeah, everybody knows that because we have doctors and specialists, and there has been so much research done on this little blood pump, you know, thumping away in your chest, old faithful, gushing out blood to keep you alive. And maybe you had a scare. We actually had a scare in all serious. We had a scare with one of our staff members, Gwen Pig. She's our um, preschool director, and she recently had a major, massive heart attack. And as it turns out, it didn't have anything to do with French fries. She had a congenital heart defect. Now, how would she have known that? I mean, you could look at her, and you could say, hey, Gwen, how's your heart? And she would say, well, I think I'm doing fine. But then the next day, she was on her way to the ER, her heart having stopped 
in her chest. Praise God, she's okay. Praise God, she's resting at home, recovering from this massive heart attack. She had to have four bypasses. Poor lady. And her husband, Ronnie, and their whole family, you know, they're around her and they're taking good care of her. Are you as concerned about your heart, and I'm not talking about the one thumping in your chest. Are you as concerned about the heart that thinks and feels and chooses and says and does as you are about the blood pump that thumps in your chest? Because here's what I'm going to tell you. If this heart is vulnerable, your spiritual center is even more so. The Bible tells us what can happen to your heart, the center of who you are. The psalmist says, I am poor and needy and my heart is wounded within me. Your heart can become wounded. Jesus says, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Your heart can be deceived. David prays, give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Your heart can be divided. Paul summarizes the fall of human beings and declares, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their hearts became, I'm sorry, their their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Your heart can become darkened. Jesus, frustrated at his disciples, these are, these are Christians, Jesus followers, right? People following after Jesus, the writer says they had not understood about the loaves. They didn't know what Jesus was talking about. And their hearts were hardened. Even Jesus' followers can be wounded, have wounded hearts, deceived hearts, divided hearts, darkened hearts, and even hardened hearts. But here's the kicker. God's saying what He plans to do when He sends the Messiah, He plans to do in order that He would recapture the hearts of His people Israel, who have all deserted me for their idols. Your heart can be taken captive. So there it is. You knew, don't eat too many french fries. Take it easy on the salt. If you're feeling some... tightness in your chest, some shortness of breath, call 911. We've been well schooled on how to care for our hearts, even though I can't see it. I don't know, I don't know what's going on in my heart. I guess as long as it's still, you know, thumping along at 60 to 100 beats per minute, I think I'm okay. I'm certainly not asking any of you to cut me open and show me how it's doing, but I want to know that my heart, this heart is healthy, and look what can happen to the place from which everything you think and do can flow. It can become wounded, deceived, divided, darkened, hardened, and even taken captive. And it also says, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. If you ask your heart, how you doing, your heart will lie to you. I'm just fine. I'm not wounded. I'm not deceived, I'm not divided, I'm not darkened, I'm not hardened, I'm not captive. Pay no attention to me, I'm just fine. Oh boy, that's some tricky heart you got there. The reason the writer of Proverbs says, above all else, guard your heart, is because your heart is both your most valuable part and also your most vulnerable part. If everything you do flows from your heart, 
you got to be sure God is interested in it, and you better be sure so is the enemy. Very interested in the condition of your heart. So, the writer of Proverbs, himself a father, says, listen to me, my son. The Proverbs are all written from a father to a son, or if you like, from a father to a child. If you're going to be wise, if you're going to know how the world works, if you're going to honor God, if you're going to get it right and prosper and all this, above all else, guard your heart. Your most valuable, your most vulnerable. I need uh, two volunteers for this night. Now, I brought a a firearm with me here today, and I checked with our security team, and I have assured them that this is a non-lethal firearm. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to discharge this firearm within an enclosed space, but it is non-lethal, and I assure you no one will get hurt unless you're standing within, say, a foot and a half of the barrel here, all right? So, 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 so relax. And I need two, two volunteers to come and show me why all right, I, see, I see two badgets. Uh, raising their hands. All right, all right. So yes, back there's that Wes. I can't see under the lights. And and one other. All right, Benjamin, come on up. <clears throat> the junior badger is very offended. <laughs> all right, so I want two people that are basically the same height. All right, so come on over here. You're taller than he is. Yes. Let's make sure we announce that here. Benjamin's very happy to that you did point it out. All right, why don't you stand over here, Wes, on this side of me? <clears throat> Thank you, Wes for being bold and coming forward. It's a good family back there, Sappingtons. <laughs> all right. So now this is a, this is a pop gun, all right? You knew that, right? Now, so if you're th- under three, you're not supposed to play with it, but I think you guys are good. This is a little warning label. Not for children under three. All right. So now you know how this works, right? You pump the air in, and then you, and then you do that. All right. So I'm going to let you hold the gun. <laughs> Be careful now, all right? So I'm going to let you hold the gun. So now, um, the, come on over here on the other side of the table. So you're right here. So I'm going to let Benjamin be my heart for a moment. This is my son, right? This is my son. Uh, I'm going to let him be my heart. So you're my heart, and you're vulnerable. And Wes, I mean, he's looking a little shifty over there. I don't know. He's looking a little shady, and he's holding a gun. Now, the Scriptures say to guard my heart. So, so what, do you, what do you think I should do, Benjamin? Should I be like, pfft? I'll let you guys fight this one out. Or, or should I be like, well, now, wait a second. My heart, he's a little shorter, and he's vulnerable. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like this, right? Don't yeah. you come near here, brother. All right? Don't you. Because he's got, he's got a gun. I'm going to guard my heart. Now, who could Wes be? Let, let's, let's switch it around because I don't want anybody to think Wes is a bad guy. Wes is now my heart. I love you, brother. <laughs> Wes is my heart. And, and who, who could he be? Who, who could be coming for my heart? Here, give me an example. Satan. Satan. The devil, right? The scriptures say he prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's not literally eat people, right? It's, he's looking for my heart. He wants to deceive me. The, the scriptures say the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is a spiritual death. I better protect my heart from the devil. But, but who else? Who else could be here holding a gun and coming for my heart? Who else? I can't hear you. Telephone. Telephone. Telephones. All right, now, are you talking about temptation maybe? Okay, so distraction, temptation. So the things of this world? Yes, okay, so the telephone is an example of a way that I could get distracted. Or I could get, you know, my kids are over here, hey, Dad, come play with us. And I'm like, no, no, I'm just saying I'm surfing Facebook. Yeah, okay, so, but, but by and large, we're talking about temptation. So I better, don't you come near here, all right? Don't you come around my heart. It's my heart. I got to protect him. Who else? Who else might come from my heart? There's basically one more. Internet. Say again? Internet. Internet, yeah. Let's put that under that category of temptation, right, that my heart is vulnerable to. What about other people? Other people, right? So here's my heart, and he's drawn sometimes to other people, wants to be buddies. 
And maybe he thinks, that's not a gun. It's a toy. Let's go play. And my heart, you know, is easily wounded. My heart might come over here and say, hey, let's go play with that gun. It looks like fun. And in the meantime, this person right here could be a threat to my heart. Yes? Have you ever known somebody that hurt your heart? Maybe they meant to, maybe they didn't mean to. But your heart is vulnerable, so the Scriptures say guard your heart. All right. Now you're, good job, good job. All right. Stand here for a second. I might still need you. So you're my heart, right? I switched it, right? So Wes didn't think I was calling him the devil. My son didn't mind being called the devil. <laughs> All right. So, so you're my heart. Now you were playing around the other day, you know, with some friends, and you happened to pick up off the ground this gun from one of your friends. Now I'm over here making sure that the devil and the world and all the bad people in the world don't get near my heart. But is that the only way my heart could get hurt? What's he got in his hands? A non-lethal weapon. But for the purposes of this illustration, he could hurt himself, couldn't he? I mean, this is a gun, and he's playing with a gun. My heart needs not just for me to guard against external threats. My heart also needs me to watch over it. And hey, hey, let me take that from you here, brother. You could get hurt with that. And so I watch over my heart. My heart is prone to wander Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. And this, I believe, is why the writer of Proverbs uses two words to describe what we must do. We must guard and we must watch over. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Let's give a hand to the hearts. <clears throat> Above all else, guard your heart. Protect it from harm. So many bad things can happen to your heart. But here's the thing. Your heart is also its worst enemy. How did Israel get taken captive to begin with? It's because they deserted God and worshipped idols. God said, make sure you don't intermarry with the nations. Make sure you don't let their gods be your gods. Make sure you keep out what is a threat to your heart. But he also said, you better watch your own heart because your own heart will lead you astray. What's the state of your heart? How's it doing? He said, well, I recently went to the cardiologist and I'm fine. I'm not asking about that heart. He said, well, I mean, as I think about it, Pastor, I appreciate you asking the question. I appreciate you showing some concern about me and my heart, my spiritual center, the center of everything that I say and do. And, and, and I'm thinking about it here, reflecting on it, because you're asking me to do so. And yeah, I'm, my heart's fine. It's fine. I feel really good about my heart. And I ask you, how would you know? How would you know? Well, I've kept all the temptation at bay. I've not followed after the devil. You know, the thing, I've got to live in the world, so the things of this world are in my life, but I'm not going to take too much in. I'm going to make sure that I protect my heart. Are you watching over that heart of yours? Because he, she will stray. Are you paying enough attention to where your heart is wandering? Now, I don't say this so that you would always and forever be questioning every thought, every motive that you ever have. But the question is, how would you know the condition of your heart? You can't see it. You can't put your hand in there and go, oh, oh yeah, it feels right, yep. Yeah. Even a cardiologist couldn't tell you how your heart is doing. I mean, they could strap you up with leads and electrodes and all that, and they can read what the blood pump is doing and how it's doing. 
But your heart doctor cannot tell you how your heart is. If you and I were to meet together and we were to talk for 10 hours and I asked you every question under the sun, I still wouldn't know enough to be able to tell you the precise condition of your heart. I said, well, I think. Well, it sounds like. Well, based on my expert opinion, there is one person who alone knows your heart. One, and it's not you. You're probably better than most, but you're not always a trustworthy witness. We like to think the best of ourselves, don't we? I mean, I do. I like to think the best of myself. Somebody says to me, I think your heart's in the wrong place. How dare you? My heart would never be in the wrong place. (laughs) Maybe by reflection, maybe by some self-examination. But if I can know my heart all by myself, doesn't that mean I can fix my heart all by myself? And if I can do all that all by myself, then I can fulfill the command to guard my heart more than anything else. (sighs) But here's the deal. Only the great physician knows my heart down to the last detail. And only the great physician can heal my heart and help my heart and enlighten my heart. Paul prays that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. Who's going to do that? Who's going to enlighten the eyes of your heart? Well, there's only one. There's only one. And we sang to him earlier today, let the king of my heart. The question for you today is, will you fulfill Proverbs 4.23? Will you say yes to what the scriptures say? Yes, I will guard my heart more than any other part of me. I will guard, watch over Keep watch over my heart because I recognize that everything I do and say and believe and think and remember and and choose and all of that, it all comes up out of my heart and so I will guard it by surrendering it to Jesus because I'm no good at it. (laughs) I mean, I, I did such a poor job. I mean, I managed to eat all the French fries in the world, spiritually speaking, and I'm just not a trustworthy guard. That doesn't mean I'm not going to pay attention to my heart. It doesn't mean I'm not going to get regular checkups on my heart. But I am going to prioritize my heart health. I am going to make sure my heart gets the best care it can. I am going to give my heart to Jesus to let him take hold of it and let him tell me what the condition of my heart is. Which is to say, I'm going to allow the scriptures to speak. I'm going to come in on a Sunday morning and I'm going to say, I've opened up my heart before you. If you need to do surgery, if you need to do a quick bypass here while I'm here and the preacher's talking, if you want to draw my heart out in worship because while I've been standing here like this and everybody else has got an open heart and I'm thinking, well, what's God done for me? I'm not going to do any, I'm not going to worship him. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's been knocking on your heart. Saying, you thought all you needed to do was say a few words, pray a prayer, and then your heart is great. Now, only by yielding your heart to me, Jesus said, Only by letting me be king of your heart. Only by letting me tell you how to think and how to feel and how to choose, what to say and what to do. Well, you're talking about letting Jesus guide me in everything. (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because otherwise, your heart is on its own. And with as many enemies... As much hurt 
and as much heart disease as in this world, and with your heart not really being trustworthy to begin with, there's only one, only one way to fulfill Proverbs 4, 23, and that is to let Jesus take ownership of your heart. He stands at the door, he knocks, he says, if you hear my voice, let me in and I'll be in. And you and I will hang out and fellowship and I'll show you the way and I'll show you how to love and I'll show you how to choose and show you how to think. I'll show you how to worship. I'll show you how to praise. I'll show you how to raise a family. I'll show you how to do everything that you want to do in this world only give me your heart and Paul says and the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus let's pray Lord Jesus it's such a joy to know (laughs) My heart, as wounded and divided as it tends to be, has one king, and that king is not me. Lord Jesus, you know that every now and again, there's a little miniature rebellion in my heart, where the old king of my heart, Jonathan, thinks, plans, and acts as though he's in charge again, and you're not. Oh boy, do I get myself in some fine messes when I think I can rule my heart just as well as you. Lord Jesus, forgive me again and again and again. For the way in which I've not only done a poor job of guarding my heart, but I have pushed you out and not let you be my heart's king. Jesus, I don't think I'm the only one in this room. I know I'm not the only one in this room. I know I'm not the only person on this live stream who has a tendency to wander. And there may be some here today or watching who have never surrendered their hearts to you. They've never said, Jesus, come, take ownership of my heart. Come, occupy my heart. I will let you be king of my heart. And so for today, God, for each of those people, I pray, Lord, knock again. Speak again. Invite again. I'm right here. Let me in. And God, as we go through this series on the heart, and as we talk through all the things that can happen to our hearts, even as believers, and how we should handle those heart problems, Lord, make us a people with open hearts. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we could see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, no longer deceived by the God of this world, no longer so concerned about the blood pumps pounding in our chests that we forget your concern is our spiritual hearts. And you'll keep our blood pumps pumping until we figure out who owns our hearts. Friend, today, Jesus is calling. Friend, today, let him in. Let him own your heart. Let him take possession of your most valuable treasure and let him transform you from the inside out. Make it so, Jesus. Amen.